All right, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Xavier Tyson. I'm part of the McGuire Energy Institute, uh, which is celebrating its 50th year of existence here at the Cox Business School at uh, Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. I will start by uh, thanking the organization um, of Marietta College and uh, U of H for putting this conference together. Having put one of these together, a multi-day session, I know the fun uh, that it takes uh, and hard work that it takes to put one of these conferences together. So um, good job, and uh, you're almost done with day one. Uh, congratulations. It's my pleasure to uh, be moderating this panel today centered around collaborative approaches for climate change mitigation. To explore this to topic, uh, let me introduce our distinguished and estimated panelists. The first one, Tilsa R. Monago, uh, fellow for the Center of Energy Studies at the Baker Institute for Public Policy and a lecturer uh, for the Master's in Energy Economics program, the Department of Economics and Department of Computer Science at Rice University. Uh, the second, uh, Young Huck Chow, Cho, is that correct? Uh, yes. Applied economist and a data analyst teacher at uh, SUNY Genasco Business School. The third, Jim Crane, fellow uh, for energy studies at Rice University, Baker Institute for Public Policy, also at Rice University. And uh, Joao Venancio, senior lecturer of chemical engineering of the Eduardo Mondle Mondleo University, the first and larger university of Mozambique. Um, before we start our discussion in the panel, let me cover a few comments first. Uh, no one in the audience has been talking about climate change, right? We don't know what we're talking about here. Um, these days, it's on every channel, every television, everything uh, that we can actually uh, get our information from. Um, perhaps a bit of burnout already, but however, I'd like to clarify the mitigation part. So climate change mitigation means avoiding and reducing emissions specifically of the heat trapping greenhouse gases, decarbonizing would fit into this topic, certainly. Of course, um, this shall not be confused with another also very important concept of climate change adaptation, um, sure, uh, meaning alter altering our behavior and systems and in order uh, for our way of life to protect our families and economies and environment in which we we'll live in. Today's discussion will only focus on um, the collaborative approaches for emission reduction. I do believe that emission reduction is not something that can be addressed rather quickly, uh, but let's get going discussing this topic. I would like to first talk about the differences across the globe. Um, we do share a single atmosphere, but every location, every country seems to be dealing with a different set of cards to address this dual challenge. By the way, I'll do a shout out to Professor Scott Tinker from UT, who talks about this dual challenge of having to uh, reduce emissions and continue sustaining an economy. So on this panel, we have several perspectives. And I will start perhaps opening it up to Tilsa first uh, on the landscape specifically for South America. What do you think uh, would make progress there better? and what has been your experience with South America so far? What can you see? Can you share that with us, please? Hello, everyone. Thank you, Xavier. Uh, for, um, thank you for the invitation for this uh, conference. Um, to your question directly. Um, so South America, uh, and in general, Latin American countries actually are one of the regions that are greener. <laughs> so they have the cleanest, uh, uh, energy matrix and most of the electricity uh, comes from renewable energy uh, basically hydro uh, and then uh, the efforts for uh, increasing renewable energy uh, has been really good uh, particularly in countries like chile and uh, in countries like uruguay and, and costa rica uh, and many others are are following uh, right now uh, colombia and brazil uh, also are joining a lot of uh, efforts to increase investment in renewable energy. Um, I think uh, much of the efforts uh, on mitigating um, 
climate change uh, are there. Um, I, I can talk about uh, Chile. Chile is, um, I would say, that the most developed country within South America. Uh, it's also a country that lacks any other resources. <laughs> so it, it, it doesn't have oil, it doesn't have gas. So it relies a lot on, on imports. So maybe that is why also that they have the high incentives to clean their matrix, uh, energy matrix there. Um, so what they were doing is that, and luckily here, is that uh, Chile has the strongest solar radiation uh, in the world, in the north, uh, in the north, in, in the northern area, uh, particularly in Atacama Desert. And I uh, also have a very strong wind power in the south, uh, near Magallanes area. And what I saw in Chile, and I put it as an example, is that, like, that there is an, a strong willing power to actually change uh, their dependency on fossil fuels. So they had already carbon taxes in places. And since 2020, they have, uh, a, a bigger goal in um, producing green hydrogen. So most of the green hydrogen progr programs or projects in, in South America and Latin America are actually in Chile. Um, and the other thing that they are doing is not only um, working on green hydrogen uh, projects, but also uh, private companies are really uh, into decarbonizing uh, their uh, uh, their activities, uh, in particular mining companies, I would say. So I have been looking into the um, into the importance of, of critical minerals, and of course, Chile uh, has a big role as well in in the energy trans in the energy transition because of it. So it's a first uh, producer of copper in the in the world and is uh, uh, now the second largest producer in for lithium and has the highest reserves of lithium uh, for that so we know that we need lithium for batteries and for uh, and for energy storage um, but I uh, think it's also that mining is an activity that is very energy intensive so mining companies were working together as private um, as, a, as a private goal to decarbonize their activities as well. So uh, mining now is looking for decarbonizing, for example, their fleet of trucks, these giant trucks that use around 3,000 uh, liters of diesel per day. So it's a lot of, th of that. Uh, like average uh, uh, mining operations use maybe like between 10 and 20 of these trucks every day throughout the year. So already having these, uh, uh, these projects, uh, I think, um, is um, a giving uh, a little bit more of push into uh, decarbonizing and, mit and, and, and mitigation uh, policies. Another thing that I, I would like to address is that um, what we need, and this comes from the experience in, in, in Latin America, because also we have uh, all these uh, um, mining projects, uh, is uh, to take into account uh, how local communities are perceiving all uh, these activities. So local community engagement, I think, is really key uh, for any kind of mitigation uh, projects. Uh, and uh, energy related projects as well. Um, it has been, uh, I think um, l these l latest months, I was talking, for example, uh, with a student in Mexico. Uh, she comes from an indigenous community in Oaxaca. So she was um, talking to me about uh, this Ventosa area uh, uh, where there is a lot of wind power right now, like we have a they, they, they have these wind farms and she was telling me that there were mm, some people that uh, were opposed to that project and some people that are still opposed to all their kind of uh, infrastructure projects. So it seems that um, 
uh, many of the advances that we are doing as well are uh, is trying to be imposed sometimes to the local community and it will be really important to have them on board so community engagement is actually also key to uh, have all these projects uh, develop according to how we planned so i, I think i will stop here <laughs> thank you tilta for the for the flavor of, of the of south, from the south american standpoint uh, I'd like to bring Joao to the forefront now and talk about, you know, since you're in Mozambique and we are probably all aware of what's happening there in Mozambique, but is, uh, and I'm referring to the uh, petroleum development that we all read in the papers and whatnot. Um, in, in Mozambique, Joao, can you help us understand the driver? Is, is the mission the most important concern in Mozambique at the moment? You're, you're muted. Uh, yes, uh, maybe I, I can start by talking about a little bit about uh, the contest because Mozambique is in Africa, so uh, Africa is a continent with about 1.2 billion people, 18% uh, of the world population, and only consumes about about 3% of the energy produced worldwide. So the African Development Bank place number of Africans that lack electricity to be about half of uh, of that. Uh, it's about six hundred million people lack lack uh, access to electricity. Uh, that is, you know, our generation is something that uh, of big concern when we talk about uh, emissions. So the IEA estimates that the world will invest about uh, 2.4 trillion uh, in energy just last year. Uh, it's a figure I, I found it's, uh, at the report from EIA, IEA. Uh, and uh, from out of the 2.4 trillion, uh, 140 billion is the amount that was invested in Africa since 2021. And the, the figure refers to the 2021 to 2025. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's a, a measure, measure of uh, the deficiency in terms of uh, energy investment in, in Africa. So, uh investment in in energy in africa is a very big concern uh, it's something that uh, and the development of uh, the continent itself uh, so in terms of uh, investment to tackle the aspects that was Agreed in Paris Agreement, uh, the African needs about 1.3 to 1.6 trillion US dollars to tackle the Paris Agreement. Uh, that what what was agreed in Paris Agreement, Paris Climate Agreement, in terms of uh, limitation of uh, increase of temperature to two degrees centigrade or at best 1.5. So in Africa, energy transition uh, relies more on uh, ad heavily on adequate financing. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of uh, investment that are required to in order to Africa to contribute to the emission reduction. So in terms of Mozambique, our contribution in the country is, is very small, it's very little. It's, it's, it's about 0.02% uh, of the world carbon dioxide emission each year. So that's very negligible. Uh, however, uh, there are three massive 
LNG projects that are in pipeline. Uh, one of them actually has started to produce uh, on December last year, November, December last year. Uh, so floating uh, LNG on offshore Cap Delgado province. Uh, and uh, there are others being planned to start uh, to be implemented from next year. Actually, the natural gas project start, the first one was based in 5 TCF that was discovered in the southern part of Mozambique in the 60s, but the project started to produce in 2004. Uh, it's, the, it's basically for export. 90% of the gas that is produced there is exported to South Africa. Uh, and the South Africa they use for GTL and the power uh, for power generation. Uh, the 10% is, is used in Mozambique for the industry. Uh, some of the industries that they converted from coal to, to natural gas. So it is expected that in the northern part of Mozambique, other projects, LNG, very massive LNG projects will come into operation. And from 2028 um, on. So, Thank you. So to, to, uh, to sorry for the interrupt, but, but uh, bringing it back to the subject of the conversation here, which is yes. climate change mitigation, it sounds like, I'm going to paraphrase here, it sounds like you guys are really concerned about developing because you're not emitting uh, and there's not much to emit, correct? Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Jim, I'll ask you uh, your point of view from a different part of the world, uh, from the Middle East. Uh, what, what, um, what's yet different in the Middle East? Uh, is there perhaps some, some credibility issues here, in your opinion, with the setup or... Yeah, um, in short, yeah. So, uh, you know, Middle East is sort of two Middle Easts, if you will. There's an energy poor part, you know, a part of the region where, uh, you know, you've got uh, countries like, not too much different than Mozambique in emissions terms, right? So Yemen or, uh, you know, Eritrea, um, uh, you know, some other uh, countries not quite as uh, underdeveloped as those, but um, uh, but also not big emitters. Um uh, Jordan or, uh, you know, Lebanon, et cetera. Um, but then you have, uh, you know, the, um, the wealthy uh, oil producing countries, you know, at the other extreme, you know, very wealthy, uh, Qatar, uh, Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates, um, you know, where per capita emissions are, um, uh, you know, off the charts, right? So, uh, you, know, um, you know, Qatar, I think the last time I looked, it was about uh, 40 tons per person per year uh, on a per capita basis. You know, we're here in the U.S. It's about 14. Um, you know, the EU average I think is now less than five, um, and the world, the global average is um, you know a little bit below that. So uh, you know, China's I think China's emissions are around uh, um, you know around seven uh, per capita. Uh, so. Um, you know, you've got countries with virtually no emissions you know, and some that have really, really high, uh, you know, even on a, um, you know, a, you know, Saudi Arabia is above uh, 500 tons, uh, for, sorry, 500 million tons uh, uh, per year. So it's pretty, um, you know, it's, it's a big emitter. It's um, you know, bigger than Chile, for example, or big, it's, it's just behind Canada and South Korea um, and, and it's ahead of Brazil, right? So, um, so you know, some, some uh, you know, it's in, it's in a, um, uh, uh, you know, the, so, so some very, very big emitters uh, in that part of the world. Um, it has to do with the climate, uh, has to do with the, uh, you know, availability of cheap uh, fossil fuels. Um, uh, and it also has to do with the, you know, with, with, uh, with prices, uh, you know, prices on, uh, on energy products and services in that part of the world are generally, uh, you know, are among the lowest in the world. I mean, you know, other than Venezuela, really all the, uh, the top subsidizers on, on, uh, fossil fuels are in the Middle East. Um, and, uh, you know, get, you know, diesel fuel in Saudi Arabia right now is, uh, is 75 U.S. cents per gallon, right? We're here. It's uh, you know, it's about four dollars right now. So it's um, you know, a barrel of oil inside Saudi Arabia 
uh, is allocated to, um, uh, you know, to, to users for about $6, you know, where it's about, you know, 80 to $90, uh, you know, outside the Saudi border. So, so you have very high emissions, uh, very high energy intensity, very high carbon intensity in those countries. Um, but you also have a lot of wealth um, and they're also on the, the, the front lines of climate damage, right? So these countries are also very hot, um, you know, and, and the cities that are on the, especially the Persian Gulf are really, really humid. Uh, and, um, you know, it's a really dangerous combination in a warming world where, um, you know, it's just the, uh, you know, we're not far off of actual deadly, uh, 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 you know, summer heat waves there that will kill you if you don't have access you know, even if you're a healthy uh, adult person, uh, otherwise healthy, you can die uh, from exposure to those temperatures that are um, uh, 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 they're right on the horizon in that part of the world. So, um, and you've got rulers in that part of the world who expect to be in power, you know, for you know up to you know 40 or 50 years, right? So this is going to be a problem. You know, climate damage is a problem. They're going to be grappling with, uh, you know, while they're still uh, in power, right? So this is something they they have to worry about. So it's like a lose-lose situation if you look at it from their perspective, right? So I mean, they have, you know, they're going to lose if, if climate action fails because their, you know, their countries could become unlivable for parts of the year. Uh, and then if, if climate action really succeeds uh, and really drive down fossil fuel combustion, you know, their economies are going to suffer and that would that'll probably bleed into their political systems. I mean, these are autocratic systems for the most part uh, that, stay in power by using, you know, oil and gas uh, revenues to, 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 to buy public support. So they're in a tight spot. Um, they have, uh, to some extent, uh, begun to invest in, in alternative energy uh, sources, mainly solar, right? So there's no, there's, there's no moving water at all, no rivers or permanent uh, lakes or anything on the Arabian, the entire Arabian Peninsula, right? So Iraq's got a little bit of moving water, Iran very little. Uh, Egypt does, of course, but um, most of the countries don't have access to uh, to hydro. Uh, they do have access to solar. There's been some pretty big solar uh, projects built. Uh, there's there's a few up and running in uh, in the UAE, especially they're the leader. Uh, Israel also has uh, has a number of them. Uh, the Saudis are starting uh, to build a few, uh, but that is about it. I think the UAE has got. Less than five percent, for sure, of their electricity is is, is produced by um, uh, renewables. Uh, Saudi Arabia, it's it's, it's less than half of one percent. Uh, so really, really small amounts uh, of uh, of renewables uh, at this point. Uh, UAE also has some nuclear power that they're bringing on stream, so zero carbon nuclear uh, and, and four big um, uh, uh, nuclear power uh, generation stations there um, coming online now. So. Um, you know, so they're they're taking some steps, um, but as you know, compared to the rest of the world, they're way behind. Uh, they are the they are the laggard uh, in clean power globally. I mean, I just looked at this with a student uh, yesterday, uh, and we looked at all the different regions and in terms of percentage of of power from um, uh, from clean energy sources. There at the at the very bottom. So, um, so a lot more to do. Um, but you know, they have. Um, they have the type of governance where they can push policy through quickly, uh, and they also have the uh, the cash to get there. Thank you, Jim. Um, if you don't mind, uh, maybe I think uh, there's Tilsa who has a uh, a way a visualization of these emissions. Is that correct, Tilsa? Can you share your screen real quick uh, yeah, to bring sure. it back? So we're not, I guess, all dealt the same deck of cards throughout the world, and that's important to understand when it comes to emissions um, and how different countries have to um, to respond to their to the cards they're given, I guess. Let's okay. talk it that way. Go ahead, Tilsa. Yeah. Very, very quick. Um, yes, as, uh, as they were mentioned, uh, this is, I think, the contributions to CO2 emissions by country and per income group. So the red ones are the high income and and the bubble size here give us the measure of annual CO2 emissions by country. So um, you see that there are many, and, and possibly these, these small ones are, you know, the ones that in the Middle East that Jim was talking about. Um, upper middle country are also big on this, what we have in, in the 
horizontal axis, we have annual per capita CO2 emissions. So these, these are CO2 emissions per inhabitant. <laughs> so also we see this disparity. And as Joao was mentioning, I mean, low income countries, lower middle income countries are, you know, per capita wise, they are consuming really less, less than five tons, much less than that, maybe even lower than, than one <laughs> ton per year. And, and this is, you know, GDP per capita. And, and, and I think this is uh, very important. Also, I have this um, visual uh, when we see the evolution. Uh, we have, of course, that emissions have grown uh, uh, throughout the world. Uh, but here the lines are depicting uh, the evolution according to income groups. So we have here the green line, which is almost near zero. This is uh, low income countries. So here are most of Africa, part of uh, Latin America. And, and this is a uh, low income, lo low middle income countries. And of course, they are much lower than uh, um, upper middle countries and high income countries, but it's still uh, now increasing, right? And one of the things that Joao say that is really important is that um, electricity access is actually a problem in, in, in lower middle income countries and, and low income countries. So uh, mitigation uh, action goals should also take uh, that into account, right? It is not only to, oh, let's decarbonize the world and, and, and now everything is electric, but uh, you have people that still doesn't have electricity, even even not for refrigerators, you know? Uh, uh, and, uh, and there are people also that are facing very hard uh, heat conditions and they don't have electricity for AC. And so that, those are the things that I want to say. And if you allow me, that the, the picture between uh, income levels uh, and, and the sectors that are actually contributing to the gas emissions change according to the income level. So high income countries, most of their emissions comes from electricity and heat. It is a lot. Uh, and then we have transportation. And that, that explains why most of the mitigation actions are coming for electrifying things, right? And, and we have the electric uh, mobility over here. If we go to the low income countries, most of the uh, green gas house emissions comes from agriculture. And, and then we have transportation that is almost nothing. So this is also that something that we, we should take into account when we are talking about what kind of mitigation policy we are addressing uh, in, in which part of the world. It will depend a lot on, on the conditions that they, uh, that each country are facing uh, for that. Um, I think that, that does, I have something else. Oh. This is just a share of electricity generation. Uh, uh, yes, a lot of oil and, and coal and, and, and gas. Uh, and there is uh, another one here that it's for our work in data. And what we need to do is good policies to reduce the, the, the consequences of our uh, GHG emissions. So I will stop here. <laughs> Thank you, Tilsa. Um, I'll bring you back and maybe switch. Uh, to, so we all understand we're given different situations and constraints to deal with, which makes this problem very, very complicated to solve, right? Because everybody's trying to solve it for their region and their set of constraints. Um, but bringing it back to the topic of, uh, of, of the collaboration to solve this issue, uh, let me ask uh, Jan Hack, what, what do you think, who do you think the best players are to address this? Is it governments? Is it companies? Is it NGO communities? Tilsa mentioned earlier, communities need to be included. Um, who has the biggest impact? Uh, okay, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, in my opinion, I think the government has the biggest role in mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the reason is that the like private sector don't have a like direct incentive to uh, like combat this climate change mitigation. Uh, so if there is no any government uh, actions, 
uh, for this uh, uh, climate change mitigation, uh, private sector would not uh, make uh, so sufficient effort uh, enough to uh, uh, reduce greenhouse gas emission by themselves. So I think the government should implement uh, proper uh, uh, like uh, stringent uh, climate policy to incentivize them uh, to uh, reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Great. Let me uh, let me follow up and, and I'll open it up. Whoever wants to answer this question is um, there's I guess. So the answer uh, being the the governments and the government policies that are set. There's different styles, right? You most of you must have heard of the IRA, right? Which is the the path that the U.S. has taken and that can be seen uh, sort of as a carrot, right, to entice development of of the new technologies and whatnot. Versus a model or more of a stick approach uh, that has been taken in Europe. Um, what do we need? Is this how it's going to work? You know, do we need one? Is one, is one better than the other? Any thoughts on that, Jim? May perhaps? Well, yeah. I mean, I would agree with uh, with Byung Hark. I mean, uh, government governments have the tools to to you know for to for everything up to up to and including an outright ban on uh, you know certain fuels or technologies that use them. You know, so and we're seeing that. So some countries are are phasing in bans of internal combustion engines. Uh, some mm -hmm. countries have already imposed bans on coal-fired power, uh, burning coal to make electricity. So, And you don't need a lot of countries to do this, to move the needle. I mean, you know, as, as Tilsa was showing us, most of the emissions are in a few countries, uh, you, know, um, you know, one middle-income country and, and, and uh, I mean, you know, wealthy countries are, are where that's where the you know that's where the game is for on emissions. So um, you know we don't need to 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 to, to squeeze emissions savings out of uh, you know the underdeveloped world. I mean it's it's the it's the it's the big developed countries for the most part that that are the, are the ones that are uh, responsible for the emissions that are in the atmosphere now, and and most of the ones that are going up there you know uh, uh, every day. You know so if you think about the emissions in the atmosphere already, about forty six percent of those came from coal. And right now, you know, the top three coal consuming countries are, are um, you know, they're consuming about 70 percent, if not a little bit more uh, of global coal. So those three countries, you know, China, India and the United States, uh, if they chose, if their governments chose to, to take action, they could move the needle uh, on this problem. Um. Any any other thoughts on that for, uh, from a um, approach from a government standpoint? Anyone else? I I can add a little bit on that, and and nice yes, as 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 Bjorn Hag and, and, and Jim uh, said, yes, government has the tools and they have the policies. I mean, they they they, they can actually design a better policies that could uh, give the incentives to, uh, to, to the people. And yes, the IRA, uh, you saw it, uh, it, it was uh, uh, already enacted last year and there has been a bunch of projects, right? Looking at that. I would say that we have also to be careful because we want to be anyways energy neutral. Uh, so there are different kind of um, of developments uh, that are that are clean and, and and we should allow for for that uh, development. I would say that the the development of carbon markets it is uh, a something important, but not only from a particular uh, a government in a particular country, but globally. Uh, carbon markets and carbon pricing, for example. Uh, it's uh, is one of the um, eco 108 externality classes uh, policy remedy uh, but uh, the problem is that it only will work if it's a global policy if all the governments actually start to implement it and recently you will have this incentive uh, going to reduce the consumption of, of fossil fuel uh, and then uh, maybe increase more uh, cleaner energies uh, in, in that way. So I, I, I think uh, it is not only government, but 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 all the governments all together working uh, in this uh, aim. So having a common language, right, for collaboration, which would be this 
potentially this carbon and I mean, I, I'm going to, I'm going to push the envelope here, right? Uh, I, I'm French by birth. I'm European by history, I guess. Uh, I see how, it, how tough it is to get so many countries to work together uh, towards a common goal. And, 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 uh, perhaps I'll, uh, extend the question to Bjorn, Bjorn Hack, uh, who's, you know, uh, familiar with, with the carbon trade. Uh, is, is that, is that something that must happen? Is it feasible to think that all these countries, 197 countries on the globe would agree? Uh, or maybe it doesn't take all 197. What's your thoughts on carbon exchange, tax, credits, all of it, right? Okay. Also, I think it is, it is a great question. Uh, so if the, this global community can um, introduce like something called the global carbon tax, that would be, could be the best solution to this uh, uh, climate change mitigation problem. However, in, in practice, it's almost uh, impossible to introduce such a global carbon market. So, uh, so we are uh, in, in globe, there are a uh, regional carbon markets carbon markets across the world and they have different prices and they have different uh different caps in greenhouse gas emissions so some countries put higher price on carbon other countries put uh like some cheaper level of carbon price so uh there are some deep uh so it's because these mark local markets uh, functions differently and provide a different uh, level of incentives to mitigate the emissions uh, there are some prob uh, there um uh, there are, are uh, the this uh, localized uh, carbon market does not provide uh, enough incentive each countries to limit their greenhouse gas emissions so my sense is that the uh, uh, the one practical solution to this uh, localized market would be introducing some uh, like kind of stick uh, stick uh, approach, like giving penalty to the countries that put less uh, uh, cheaper price on carbon emissions. So, for example, if countries uh, have trade goods and services, they can like uh, put uh, some additional tariffs uh, for, to countries uh, where they put a lower uh, price on their uh, emissions. So, in this way, we can kind of equalize this uh, price of carbons across the world through these types of uh, a punishment uh, on the uh, carbon pricing mechanism around the world. So it might be uh, somehow the one practical solution. So, and recently, like, uh, as far as I aware of the European Union uh, uh, already adopted these schemes and yeah, either, uh, either being implemented globally uh, in the near future. I'll open, I'll follow up with the, uh, 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 this question and again, uh, on the panel, wide open. How difficult would it be? And this is a question that was posted for less affluent nation to participate, participate in a carbon trade. So if you're one of these countries that don't emit, doesn't, doesn't necessarily have a lot of funds, how is it? Doable for you to think of participation in this carbon trade market? I, I think it will be difficult for some countries, particularly some uh, developing countries rely a lot also in subsidies um, to fuel, uh, to fossil fuel. Like if we, for example, think about Ecuador, uh, Ecuador in within South America has large uh, subsidies to gasoline and the uh, Mm, recent president, uh, in, in his first year, he tried to eliminate all the subsidies and he couldn't do it because there were massive protests of, of, of people and indigenous, even indigenous communities that rely a lot on this cheap gasoline. So, uh, it, 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 it is, um, uh, 
desirable if, if they somehow do it, but I don't think it will be at least feasible for some countries that are that have this high reliance uh, on that. But still, um, I say I would say that um, when thinking about carbon trading, uh, I think most of the, uh, I would say that developed countries have more space and flexibility to do it. And if uh, developed countries and big countries uh, mm, already signal that they are working hard towards that, that is already enough for the small players to follow. Um, so if we don't see much on that, like, so maybe like for example, we don't see the US uh, working on, on a carbon pricing, uh, yeah, I would say like small countries will actually be willing to to go through through, through that path, right? Um, so I, I, I'm I'm paraphrasing, but I'm getting this like slide ruler, right? Of of um, perhaps um, taxation, which would be based on the amount of emissions you're doing, basically, like right? Or but I'm going back to this. You know, the U.S. Yeah. didn't pick that route, right? The U.S. picked the IRA, which is the. Uh, Joe, I'm sorry, Joe. You you had a comment to make. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll, I'd like to say that Africa first observes about 600 million tons of CO2 each year, uh, and uh, it's more than uh, any forest act ecosystem on Earth, and uh, only 11 percent of current credits issued worldwide uh, came from projects in Africa. And uh, uh, there's an in initiative that was launched in, at COP27 called African Carbon Markets Initiative uh, with the aim of producing 300 million carbon credits annually by 2030. And this is seen as a way of uh, finding some initiatives uh, that could cope climate change in Africa. Yeah, uh, yeah, I would agree with you. I don't, I don't think the, the, the carbon credits have necessarily been delivered on their promises and perhaps uh, people see what, what that does in terms of, or doesn't do in terms of the, of the atmosphere and really reducing emissions. But, um, uh, let me uh, let me then uh, take another stab at another topic for collaboration, which perhaps uh, um, can be explored, which would be uh, the the technology and the um, um, R and D, if you will. How, how crucial uh, and, and perhaps how crucial is that to this climate mitigation? Uh, how how quick do you see some of these new technologies really making a difference? Um, uh, so you want to take that on? Bianca, you want to take that on? Wait. Yes. So the reason this uh, development in clean tech technology matters a lot in this context of climate change mitigation is that uh, uh, wh while uh, the historically Globally, the countries uh, fail to cooperate successfully on this climate change mitigation. Uh, the this current technology has developed, uh, innovated over time, so that uh, uh, countries around the world could uh, uh, employ those like uh, renewable uh, energy resource to generate electricity. They could uh, kept. Uh, uh, De uh, improve, uh, developing more energy efficient technologies. So this the developing current technology might be the only could be possibly the more most robust way to address uh, climate change mitigation. And additionally, uh, if this current technology uh, developed uh, further and further at the well. Or, or distributed across the world, we can uh, the global can maybe achieve the uh, the goal of this greenhouse gas emission uh, emission reductions 
uh, basically achieving the goal of the, the global climate change agreement through the uh, uh, current techno technology development. So this the developing clean technology is the key to uh, the success in uh, clean, uh, climate change mitigation, considering uh, the uh, the difficulties in uh, climate change uh, uh, cooperation on climate change mitigation across the world. So yeah, that's my view on this uh, climate change uh, develop, uh, mitigation uh, technology. So um, technology is going to be crucial. Um, there's probably a delay into how soon certain technologies can can actually help this mitigation. Um, let, let's talk about financing those technology developments. Um, has climate finance really worked uh, to develop such things so far? Or what okay. What should be done? Go ahead, Tilsa. Yeah, I can take uh, that a little bit. So um, short answer is no, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> it's, we, we have to do a little bit more. So climate finance is basically it's uh, is about mm, financing flowing from developed countries to developing countries, and it entails two things: mitigation projects and adaptation projects. Most of the finance goes to mitigation, and there is a reason for that. Um, mitigation action uh, actually benefits everyone. Adaptation action benefits only the receptor. So in the mind of the donors, let's say, um, the benefits of adaptation projects are uh, are not shared. Um, so that's why everyone would like to, to work more in mitigation projects. From mitigation projects, there are most of them uh, in, related to energy sectors, energy projects, rather than non-energy. Um, this is also a problem, right? Um, if we think, if we see that most of the emissions are related to agriculture uh, in developing countries, and most of the projects are funding uh, energy projects, then we are not tackling the problem itself in developing countries. And the other thing is that, uh, and this is a paper that actually I, I co-author with, <laughs> with Bjorn Hack, um, is that uh, in finance we have um, committed contributions, but m most of these com committed contributions are not diverse or are not effective. And actually we have, we have a, a, a visual on that and, and this is what we have observed. So we have energy and non-energy uh, projects over here. And this is the uh, amount of contributions that were committed uh, from uh, donor countries to recipients. And uh, yes, after the Paris Agreement in 2015, these were very large. But when we go to actually provided uh, uh, financing, we see that eh, <laughs> it's really low, right? So, so. There is uh, here one problem. Um, the other problem uh, that we see and, and, and why this is also happening is that uh, access to financing is not that easy. Uh, it goes through um, through multilateral organizations, right? It, it, it goes to uh, government, the bilateral uh, agreements. Uh, but to get to that, uh, there is a lot of bureaucracy and lack of standardization, and this is costly for 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 developing countries uh, to fill out all these forms because they have to um, devote the time of persons in administrative procedures rather than implementing projects itself. Uh, so that is uh, one problem. But the other problem has to do with um, with governance. I think I have it here. Yes. Um, so this is. Uh, governance and, and renewable energy investment. Uh, um, I, I have here government effectiveness indicator and the World Bank has these renewable uh, energy indicators for uh, for sustainable environment that is called uh, RISE. And uh, 
we see that um, there is low levels of government effectiveness are related to low levels of renewable energy uh, score. And there is actually a low income countries and uh, lower income countries will have uh, lower levels of incentives and regal regulatory support. So that's another thing, governance uh, for from recipient countries uh, uh, also have some impact or will have some impact uh, in the amount of contributions that they they, they have. So governance from, uh, from, from countries uh, will, will help uh, to get more funding, but I think it is really important to expand the financing uh, and to give more access to all uh, to all the countries that need it. Thank you, Tilsa. Jim. I think you want to make a comment. Yeah, just real quick, if I don't, if you don't mind, uh, just to build on what Tilsa just said. So, you know, it's just something I've also looked at. It looks like only about fourteen percent of investment, global investment, into wind and solar. Uh, has happened outside the you know the rich OECD countries and China, right? So eighty six percent has gone to China and the OECD. Only fourteen percent uh, outside that. Um, and then some of the one of the you know um, I'd love to hear what, what others think, but you know one of the reasons is you know these big wind and solar projects require almost a hundred percent of the capital up front. It's not like building a coal fired power plant where you can, uh, you can invest a little bit up front and then you have to pay over mm -hmm. time to buy the fuel. Uh, you know, you need all the capital up front. Um, there's a low rate of return. You know, these re renewables projects, uh, you know, rates of return are not like oil and gas, right? They're, mm -hmm. they're half or, or a quarter or, you know, really much, much smaller rates of return. So the payback periods for these are long, right? So the 15, 20, 25 year payback periods on some of these projects. So that means the political risk is really, really high. You know, if, especially if you're a foreign investor um, and you want to build a renewables project into in a country that has uh, you know um, unstable political institutions, um, you know your chances of you know just a small change in the terms of the contract uh, could put that that project underwater because of those low rates of return that you might you might be at a loss. So that's one of the reasons the political risk is um, it's a tough problem for investors to uh, to overcome. So um, you know we need to need to find um, you know ways of doing that you know I mean mm -hmm. oil and gas is used to this um, and their rates of return and their payback periods are you know, rates of return are higher payback periods are shorter uh, and they can deal a bit more with small changes in in the terms of, of these agreements but but in renewables it's really hard what, what about the the who, who can actually do this types of investments who, who is really best place uh, I know for example the UN does some of these projects right? Um, anybody wants to comment? Who's best best place to make that happen if it's so difficult because of political risk? Is there an organization that that uh, I mean, are out there? Multilaterals. I mean, in the poorest countries, you know, the multilateral development banks are probably going to be the you know a, a big player, um, and then you know financing from various sources, you know, governmental sources, at least guarantee you know export credit agencies and whatnot probably have to get involved. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I'll, I have to uh, to bring a topic in uh, related to the collaboration. When I when I hear the comments about you know all the world uh, needs to get together and collaborate, uh, perhaps I'm naive, but I can't help but think of those COP meetings, right? The conference of the parties and and. Um, Perhaps some of you have seen, you know, the graph, maybe it's a, a skeptic graph, but you see in the graph the emission kind of rising and then the COP meetings keep happening and, and then no impact is, is really, uh, taking place on the emission standpoint. Yet I think of those meetings as the ultimate, right? Uh, meeting the, the planet getting together to have this discussion. Um, now there's a COP28 taking place. In, uh, in the Middle East, we, uh, you know, uh, the next one is COP28 in the Middle East. Is that going to be different? Um, maybe, uh, yes, maybe not. Somebody wants to take this this question. Jim, you have a thought? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, this is the first cop that really has the oil and gas industry as uh, players, um, you know, including the, you know, the, you know, the guy who's going to run it um, is the head of ADNOC, the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, which is one of the biggest, um, you know, oil producers and carbon, uh, you know, producers uh, globally. So, uh, and he's kind of an interesting guy. He also used to, uh, before he took the job at ADNOC, uh, ran Mazdar, which is a uh, uh, it's it's like they're uh, the UAE's renewable in, uh, renewable energy uh, a brain trust and investment uh, agency. So um, he's got, so he's got a pretty good level of experience on both sides of this. Um, you know, right now, of course, you know we've got our energy system that's in conflict with the climate, uh, and we really need you know energy firms to kind of shift uh, to new business models but also keep the lights on at the same time, right? So, you know, phase down the old and, 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 and phase up the new. And I think that, you know, to do this, you know, we need to have these big oil and gas firms uh, involved in this and need to have them on board. Uh, you know, they've got the skill set uh, for this. They know geology, uh, you know, and pipelines, you know, that are needed for carbon capture and for hydrogen. Uh, offshore wind is you know, a little bit outside their skill set, but not that far outside their skill set, right? I mean, uh, you know, big projects that, you know, that take big investment pools of capital uh, are right in their wheelhouse. You know, the, as I said, they're used to dealing with, uh, uh, you know, political risk and, and really difficult geographies. Um, and they're really good at de-risking uh, uh, in investments. So, um so I'm hopeful. I mean, I'm optimistic, I guess, you know, I mean, here in Houston, we're seeing some of this, you know, Houston's the, you know, used to be called the energy capital of the world or, you know, of America, depending on who you talk to. Um, and now Houston's trying to describe itself as the energy transition capital, um, you know, and there, there's a pretty frank realization that, you know, oil and gas uh, is not going to be as good to us over the next 25 years as it was over the last 25 years. And so there's like a, you know, there's a big, a big sort of um, a drumbeat here that, uh, you know, people are starting to move from oil and gas into uh, into alternate energy uh, careers or just looking at they're interested in it anyway. Right. So um, uh, and, you know, there's some there's some slow movement uh, in this area. So I think, it, you know, we need to speed it up, uh, of course. But um so I'm I'm hopeful, sort of in the same way that some of what I can I see happening in Houston, um, you know, might be replicated and then energized um, in um, uh, you know in the UAE, uh, uh, you know, the next couple of months. Does anyone have an, another comment, perspective on the COP meetings, perhaps today until this next one, maybe? Go ahead, Tilsa. Uh, yeah, I would say uh, that in well. Yes, it's true, right? The, the emissions are still growing, but they are still growing because we have a bunch of countries that are still developing and we will have more energy consumption that will lead to more GDP growth. And that's why we are, we are seeing it. Um, we will, maybe we will not uh, have a reduction until we see a very drastic reduction of fossil fuels. But uh, but what I see is that there are more countries, and I would say small countries that are really committed to climate policies. Again, my examples goes to to Chile, to, to South American countries, uh, but I know that other countries are also looking for for many other solutions uh, to throw to towards uh, renewable energy. Um, besides, um, I would say like now. Um, just lately, and uh, this uh, this last month, maybe we have seen more news about uh, people saying that we may get to to, to our goals in twenty fifty uh, because there are mm, more policies in place. Uh, what we need, though, uh, I, I would say that for the COP is that many of these commitments were voluntary commitments. So that also has an effect, and as we saw in in, in this climate finance graph that I that I show you before uh, when you have voluntary commitments eh, and there is no enforcement well they will just delay it uh, to to actually divorce and to actually uh, have something in place so maybe with more pressure uh, from other countries and having on board to all the players and and I would add not only uh, maybe oil and gas industry, I would add now more than ever mining companies as well. 
because now we have more reliance on, on, on mining resources and there is a lot of stress uh, because now the the demand for critical minerals is going to increase at least double or multiply by four uh, in, in the following uh, 20 years or something. And mining here, uh, it can be, yes, uh, a polluter in, 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 in the sense that they rely a lot on, on, on energy and this energy would come basically from fossil fuels and whatever it comes from the uh, electricity matrix. So they can also be part of the conversation because after all, uh, I think um, for fighting climate change and mitigate uh, the, uh, the mitigation action uh, should have everyone on board. I mean, it is not only just one part of it. I mean, everyone has to be on board. And when I say everyone, that means not only government officials, but also us. Because if you see all these uh, graphs on per capita uh, uh, per capita emissions, uh, that is that that happens also because demand for energy increases a lot, right? So uh, replacing, let's say, um, a fossil fuel uh, mobility, you know, traditional cars with electric cars will solve part of the problem, but it is not solving everything. I mean, the stress for uh, electricity will increase by a lot. The stress on uh, having more minerals like nickel, like uh, copper, like uh, lithium will increase by a lot. And um, and still, I think we, we, we need to also um, design policies that uh, would uh, uh, try to target consumer behavior of, of, of energy. I think we, we, we can change that uh, if we can implement uh, massive transportation uh, networks uh, in, in place of, you know, high highways, wide highways uh, that give incentives to to have your own car then maybe we can change something as well joe do you have a perspective on this you'd like to share on the, the fact that the fact that you know we've had i guess this is going to be the 28 we've had 27 meetings where part of the Parties were not invited, right? So, like Till says, you know, saying the oil and gas has to be part of the solution. The mining industry has to be at the table to talk about this. What's your thought? Oh, I think we might have lost John. Anyway, no problem. We'll carry on. Um, I I was wondering also because the COP meetings are such a high level of discussion. You know, you have presidents and head of states come out to these sessions. What about uh, a different, perhaps more regionalized approach to these dis discussions? Um, have, are you guys aware of any other venue besides the COP meetings where these topics are happening and perhaps decision makers can get together and address maybe uh, the regions that we discussed? Jim, have you have you heard of the climate mena um, mena week and all that stuff? Yeah. So how successful are those? Well, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, um, they're not they're not moving the needle on emissions yet. At least the one in the Middle East is not. Although there are so emissions from the Middle East are starting to flatten, um, and we're seeing uh, you know. Um, a, a, a little bit of progress there. Uh, you know, so the growth rates are coming down and in some cases they're flattening. I and mean, a lot of that's because of um, actually some subsidy reform on, on, uh, on energy subsidies there. So that's having, a, um, that's having an effect. Um, I guess one of the things that, that um, byung Hak was talking about, um, you know, when he was talking about the, um, you know, carbon tax and border adjustments um, is, that could get interesting, um, you know, and, 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 you know, that, uh, that's one of the things that I'm hoping comes up at, the, at, at, at climate talks as well. Um, you know, if we have more of an agreement on, on that, on taxing carbon um, and, 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 and imports uh, that have embedded carbon in them, um, 
it gives countries a sort of a positive incentive to uh, to reduce their carbon because they'll get free trade access to a lucrative trading block, right? So, you know, in the in this discussion, we're sort of looking at it as a negative, um, but it's also, you know, I mean, I think if you design it in a, in a, in a good way, it it, it provides a, like a a really strong incentive to put. And usually, these things are designed where you need a minimum level of a, of carbon tax or some kind of cap and trade. And what I've seen from, you know, which countries are going to be the most exposed to this, it's not the developing uh, countries that are really going to be exposed. It's ones that are really energy intensive countries that are built, that are, that are, that are exporting raw materials like, like steel or petrochemicals, uh, you know, or fertilizer or glass, aluminum, um, you know, metals. Those are the countries and those products are the ones that are, for, for, for now, are most exposed to those, those kind of tariffs, plastics, et cetera. So, so uh, you know, uh, I guess the other thing, I guess one other uh, optimistic thing <laughs> to talk about with the, at, the, at the COP is, um, you know, I used to live in Dubai. I actually had spent, spent some time working in the government there in, in, in Dubai, actually in the ruler's uh, office there. And this is a place that's hosting the COP. Uh, and they have, we're going to have the, the, the world's attention uh, is going to be on Dubai uh, during this. And I cannot imagine that Dubai is going to let that opportunity pass by without making a big splash. And this is just kind of what those guys do. Um, they like to uh, make a, a big, splashy, audacious uh, announcement. Um, so even if the, you know, parts of the copper don't succeed, I'm hoping, I'm hopeful that, uh, and just because I see them do this every time they get the opportunity when the world's attention is on them. I don't know what it's going to be. You know, I'm hoping it's a, um, you know, it's a challenge for oil producing, uh, uh, you know, economies to, uh, you know, tighten up their emissions in some way uh, and, and a pledge for them to, 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 to uh, you know, to kick off with a great example for the rest of us. But um, I don't know what it's going to be, but, it's, you know, it gives me some level of optimism. I did see a question from uh, from Don Ritter on uh, uh, the portal here asking or stating COP28 is going to be focused on the funding or transfer of funding from industrialized countries to developing countries. What can be done pre-2030 in cutting up emissions? Will China and India be developing countries in this discussion? That's the question. That's an interesting question. Uh, I suppose uh, India is going to be continuing uh, as a developing country. I'm not sure about China. Uh, China is, was one of the big balls that we had the, the, in, in our display, uh, but, uh, uh, but it's increasing a lot in, in doing things. Like now it's uh, uh, investing a lot in technology. Uh, so all these... Um, technology and clean technologies i think the leader is china uh it also has a, a particular advantage that is that it processes most of the minerals so 80 or 90 percent of the processed minerals including copper uh, and lithium are processed in china so it actually has advantage to develop more technology and do it quickly and uh and of course the its economy Although it has um, sluggish a little bit during the pandemic, uh, it has been growing for uh, for two digits for a pretty long time, right? So I think I, I think China may not be uh, 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 included as a developing country, maybe for twenty thirty or, or, or onwards. Uh, and the question again was uh, about climate uh, finance. Okay. Uh, it's not Joao here, but China is also giving a lot of funding already. So I buy bilateral agreements. So there is, a, of course, a lot of discuss, discussion about the role of, of China in the energy transition, not only because it produces a lot of the stuff that is needed, uh, but also it is given a uh, lot of loans uh, to many developing countries for infrastructure projects, for energy projects. Um, like two months, three months ago, there was a... Uh, uh, I was talking or, or listening to a, a Bolivian uh, woman saying that they were also given money 
uh, unconditionally to governments to be used for whatever they need. So that is something that China is already doing and maybe it will, it will do more, right? Um, if that is okay or not, the, I, I would say that at the end, if all this money is actually channeled to um, effective mitigation projects, I think it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, uh, e everyone is going to be benefited uh, from less, uh, less severe climate change, let's say. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a, a another turn, and and before I open it up, I see a lot of questions pumping up. But um, when you need to collaborate, sometimes uh, on any topics, more and more, we we see how our societies are. I don't know if it's just what we portray in media, but being split. You know, there's a lot of extremists come in uh, on, on perhaps both sides of an issue. Um, do you see this? climate mitigation discussions and collaborations getting better? Is it getting easier? Uh, Jim, what do you think of that topic? Is it something that is still difficult to bring these parties together is, or is it getting better than compared to when it was a few years back? Uh, well, as far as polarization goes, I can't, can't say, but I mean, if you look at the, you know, the Pew, uh, uh, you know, research has done uh, international surveys year after year on, um, you know, you know, asking just members of the public what their opinion is, uh, you know, on, on climate action and, 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 and how big of a, um, uh, you know, how urgent climate action is. And over the, um, over the survey period, I mean, you just see in those numbers, uh, you, know, the, you know, the number of, of, of people that, that, that say this is their, in their top three priorities or some, you know, their number one priority. Uh, it's just going up and up and up, um, and it really matters where you are in the world uh, as to how those numbers um, uh, uh, change. You know, I, I noticed um, one of the things I wanted to mention to when Tilsa was uh, uh, giving her initial presentation was that uh, you know Latin America, some of the that's where some of the highest numbers are of, of public concern with um, with climate, you know, the dangers of climate change. Also, in some other uh, developing countries in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, also numbers are. Uh, you know, concern is really high uh, in those places. Um, and interestingly, there, it's really low uh, in some of the countries that I look at, you know, oil producing countries in the Middle East. And uh, I mean, some of this may have something to do with the lack of, you know, there's not much in the way of civil society organizations uh, in some of these countries, and they don't have, uh, you know, climate, um, you know, you know, just sort of pressure groups that are uh, you know, raising awareness uh, around it, but um, but even in some of these countries, I mean, can, public concern, especially Kuwait. Now I'm seeing it; uh, it's really rising up the ranks as a as a really urgent issue. I mean, they've had some summer temperatures in these places that are approaching now, you know, 130 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, 54 Celsius, so just really ridiculous temperatures. So I think um, that you know, just the the, the, the notion, the sort of steady uh, you know drumbeat of disasters and and uh, uh, you know. Um, you know, it, you know, climate issues that we're seeing, uh, extreme weather is kind of pushing that, pushing that up the, uh, um, you know, up, up, up the hierarchy of concerns. Thank you, Jim. All right, so I'm going to use some of the questions that have been uh, asked here in the, in the forum, um, and I guess I'll open it up to whoever wants to to address them. Uh, the first question: Is there a real profit that will encourage companies to collaborate? What are the benefits uh, for the companies themselves? What are the benefits from the companies themselves come from collaboration? I think there is why governments should act. <laughs> so right now, as it was said, uh, renewable uh, energy projects are not actually profitable in the short term. <laughs> you cannot, as, as Jim well explained, uh, the, you really need to have high uh, capital right uh, away and then see if, if you will get uh, your revenues later. Um, so th that's why governments need to, to, to be in place. And why do we need to collaborate? Um, because only when we collaborate, uh, then the gains are going to be bigger. So there is this um, 
in, in game theory, there is a game, uh, and a more or less maybe can explain why. So we have um, two players, and, and these players are two hunters that they are looking, uh, they are starving, right? And, 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 and they can either go for a rabbit each one of them right and they do not collaborate and they go for the rabbit or they can collaborate and hunt a, a big stank a, a, a big deer right so um, in this game of course the payoff is going to be that if we collaborate uh, uh, we get a, a big a, a bigger meal together that maybe uh, we can also eat tomorrow and, and after. Uh, if we do not collaborate and if we are successful individually, we will have a small rabbit for each one, and maybe if you're a a a a, a big a, a person, then you will still be hungry, right? Uh, so you are not solving much of of the problem uh, for uh, food in this case. Uh, why do we collaborate? Well, because you want to actually get uh, a big uh, prey, right? Uh, if we don't do it, and only if you are successful in doing it, you will still can get very little. So if we want to, to do this, uh, we really need to work uh, to work together. And I would say that now, um, even uh, developed countries that maybe, uh, as, uh, as Jean said, maybe the, the, the awareness was bigger in developing countries than in developed countries where uh, the here you you don't feel much the heat because every building has AC or or, or you don't feel uh, much the changes in, in in nature because you are actually working in, in the uh, in, in buildings right and you have cities and you have concrete um, but now we have seen a lot of floods in Italy and now we have seen uh, heat. Uh, excessive heat in Spain, and we are seeing every time more natural disaster more often, and it is heating more into developed countries as well. So I think the awareness is increasing also because the impact is being seen right now in in in, in other countries. Um, I would say that the awareness for for climate change in developing countries uh, uh, maybe is higher because they are close to nature. Like if we saw that in the low income countries, uh, most of the energy uh, uh, or more, most of the emissions comes from, from agriculture. So agriculture means that they are in contact with the nature. So they actually see the changes quicker than others that we that as, as we that li that live in the city, right? So yeah. Um, I have a, another question here, pretending to um, suspect a lot of the audience uh, uh, being students. What, what opinion do you have on the, uh, the emerging class of degrees, masters of science and PhD programs at many universities around the world regarding climate change speciality? What are the challenges facing those people who hold these degrees, uh, employment chances, et cetera? Who wants to take that? I can take a crack at it if you want. Go ahead, Jim. I'm a little bit wary of some of the new uh, degree programs that are being offered. I mean, you know, just that I, I would urge folks that are thinking about that want to get into, uh, you know, climate to, uh, you know, to, 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 to probably, you know, pick a, a discipline, um, you know, and, um, and then delve into that uh, first and then use that to look at, um, at the problem of climate change. There's many different disciplines that you can, you know, whether atmospheric science, uh, you know, uh, uh, physics or uh, economics or, uh, you know, even, even political science, right? So, um, you know, lots of uh, lots of ways to get into it. Um, the, I saw that question, uh, it made me chuckle a little bit too, because yes, universities do use, especially master's programs to as revenue raising tools. Um, and so, um, yes, that that is the case. PhD, I would only urge you to tor torture yourself and get a PhD if you really want to go to uh, work in a university. Uh, if that's your goal, uh, go for a PhD. If 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 you if you're not interested in working in a university, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't go for the PhD. We have uh, one minute left, Tilsa. Um, yeah. I, I just want to ask one last question, and perhaps uh, most of you can answer very quickly. Um, 
concern, you know, we, we've reviewed a lot of challenges in this panel. Um, uh, and I, I, I'd like to ask you, are you hopeful about this climate mitigation? And, and if so, why? Chelsea, you want to take us I, off? I can. Yes. Um, yes, I am hopeful. Uh, I, I believe that people deep down are uh, thinking about humanity and not only humanity in the short term, but also in the following generations. And as long as I saw many women now uh, having roles in, in, in all these policies, I, I am hopeful that many of the policies are to, uh, to preserve humanity and to preserve uh, nature and ecology for the future. Thank you. Jan Hock? I'm also uh, kind of positive in the sense that there are increases in the public awareness on this how serious this climate change problem globally. So more uh, public awareness, the more climate change action, and more there is uh, also ongoing innovation, including technology. So yes, Jim. I'm um, hopeful, but, you know, not super optimistic that, uh, you know, that it's going to be a quick fix or something that uh, is going to go on one of these, you know, these sort of uh, very steep glide paths away from uh, uh, carbon emissions. I think it's going to be, uh, you know, pretty tough uh, next uh, five, you know, four or five decades. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, I'm kind of hope hopeful that they'll, um, you know, that we'll get a, a good collective action, collaboration and some tech get technological breakthroughs uh, as well to, to, to help us get through this issue. All right. Well, I think we're uh, past our time. I want to thank everybody uh, for, for your time, panelists, but also the, the audience. Um, I uh, hope you, uh, you enjoy this panel. And uh, I want to again thank the, uh, the folks putting this conference together. I know it's not easy. So thank you, Ahmed and Professor Solomon, uh, for hosting this session. Thank you very much.